Congratulations on your achievement, graduates. The culmination of years of work and the beginning of more work to come. In my experience, becoming a writer is a long becoming, a becoming full of uncertainty, a becoming that never feels entirely complete. In my own becoming, I've depended on a community of artists, the other writers around me, who are also doing the work of becoming. I'm particularly honored to be delivering your commencement address because graduates of the Bennington program are among my closest friends and colleagues. The graduate of the program advised me in the final stages of writing my latest book this past winter, and my mother, who is also a writer, graduated from the program over a decade ago. I've witnessed at close range how well this program supports its community of writers, and I want to recognize with appreciation that Bennington has been a particularly essential resource for the women writers in my life. I'm delivering this address at a moment of grief and rage and protest in our country. Americans are dying at the hands of the police and from a disease that has been made more deadly by racist social structures, racist economic policy, and inequalities in healthcare. Because of this disease and the political failures of this country, you're graduating at a time of profound uncertainty. Even before we arrived at this moment, the lives of artists in this country were marked by instability and uncertainty. For most artists, there was no steady income, no health insurance, no guarantee of publication or a livelihood. In 2018, a survey by the Authors Guild found that the medium annual income from writing for authors of one or more books was about $6,000. I don't intend that statistic to be discouraging to you as writers who are working to build careers. Rather, I intend it as a reminder that success in this line of work cannot be measured by income. Making it in this line of work means making art, despite all the barriers to art making, and finding an audience. In most cases, an artist who has made it, so to speak, still isn't living off their art making and still has to make money some other way. Uncertainty about economics, about politics, about life itself and the right to live it is in the air we breathe right now. I want to talk about this uncertainty and what relationship it might have to the work of making art in this moment, for this moment, and for the future. As difficult as it is to dwell in uncertainty, and I'm feeling that difficulty in my own life, I know from my work as a writer that uncertainty can be generative. Uncertainty is a central component, if not the central component of my artistic practice. Uncertainty is what drives me into my work. I turn to the page, I turn to my work as a writer, not because I know something or I'm sure of something, but because I'm unsure, because I'm full of questions and confusion. I turn to the page because my thoughts are unformed or unclear, and I'm desperate for a place to think through my own uncertainty. When I've just begun an essay, when I've just begun to explore a subject on the page, one warning sign that I'm unlikely to finish the draft is feeling overly sure of what I want to say, or certain about my stance, or secure in my opinions. There's nothing wrong with holding a set stance or a strong opinion, but that isn't where my art comes from. In my practice, an abundance of certainty is a symptom of a work that has no future and nothing to offer me as an artist. The subjects that remain alive for me on the page that become full-fledged essays are always subjects that are fraught in some way, subjects about which I have conflicting feelings and contradictory thoughts, subjects that produce more questions than answers. I often find myself writing into subjects that are both polarized and polarizing. I'm attracted to the dynamic energy of debate, but I'm repelled by polarity. And I feel that it's my work to refuse polarity, to complicate the conversation, to reframe the debate. I'm always trying to find new ways into a conversation that has become rote or predictable, to unsettle it, to unsettle myself. 
The challenge for me is to give up my safe position, my prefer preferred posture, whatever that might be, to put down my defenses, to consider the possibility that I might be wrong, to embrace contradiction, and to work from what Keats called negative capability. I'm speaking here from my own practice, but I know from my study of the essay that this practice, what I'll call essaying, has had a long and persistent presence in literature. There was Kenko in the 14th century, practicing Zuhitsu, following his brush, seeing where the pen would take him. And before him, there was Shonigan with her searching lists. There was Augustine with his confessions, Montaigne with his boundless curiosity, Sontag with her refusal of conventional wisdom, Baldwin with his capacious clarity. These writers were not working from the same template, were not reading the same text or following the same rules or even approaching their craft with the same intention. What they were engaging in was not exactly a tradition, but it was a shared practice, a practice that has been returned to again and again, a practice that is the foundation for my own work. It's worth noting before I say more about this practice that these writers were all writing during times of upheaval, of political unrest, religious conflict, widespread disease, and racial oppression. In his essay, The Creative Process, Baldwin writes, a society must assume that it is stable, but the artist must know, and he must let us know, that there is nothing stable under heaven. The artist cannot and must not take anything for granted, but must drive to the heart of every answer and expose the question the answer hides. That to me is one of the profound possibilities of writing against certainty or from uncertainty, the possibility of exposing the question the answer hides. Baldwin goes on to say, I'm really trying to make clear the nature of the artist's responsibility to his society. The peculiar nature of this responsibility is that he must never cease warring with it for its sake and for his own. Later, he adds, societies never know it, but the war of an artist with his society is a lover's war. And he does at his best what lovers do, which is to reveal the beloved to himself and with that revelation to make freedom real. That is the true prize for this work done well, the possibility of making freedom real. And that is what is at stake for us as artists, our own freedom. All they have is their freedom, Sadie Smith writes of her own essays. And the reader is likewise unusually free because I have absolutely nothing over her, no authority. This is the peculiar stance of the essayist, a stance that refuses conventional claims to authority, a stance in which the essayist asks with open wonder, what do I know? Christy Wampal writes, I believe the essay owes its longevity today, mainly to this fact. The genre and its spirit provide an alternative to the dogmatic thinking that dominates much of social and political life in contemporary America. In fact, I would advocate a conscious and more reflective deployment of the essay's spirit in all aspects of life as a resistance against the zealous close-endedness of the rigid mind. Here she's arguing for the essay, not as a genre, but as a way of life, as a sensibility, as a way of meeting the world. In Germany, Dorno writes, the essay arouses resistance because it evokes intellectual freedom and the essay's innermost formal law is heresy. The essay in Adorno's time and ours is written against orthodoxy, against rigidity, against dogma. The essay Adorno observes recoils from the violence of dogma. And perhaps this is why the essay so readily allows for experimentation, for hybridization, for formal play. It can be fractured, continuous, brief, extended, linear, circular, narrative, lyric, we write the lyric essay because of our marginal identities, writes Shamala Gallagher of Essayists of Color, B 
because our presence in schools, in grocery stores, in literature is always a little strange and troubling, is always subversive, and always requires, in big and small ways, our interpretation, our essaying, in order to make our lives possible. Here is where the essay feels most responsive, most vital, when it's taking its very shape from the experience of those who are making it. When it's a living document drawn from the margins of society and from the center of the self. Writing exists for me, Sadie Smith writes, at the intersection of three precarious, uncertain elements, language, the world, the self. Those are our tools and our trouble as writers, language, the world, and the self. Those are the grand uncertainties we face, uncertainties that remain full of possibility and rich with potential. Congratulations on your graduation. <laughs>